All right, so uh, Lindsay reached out to myself, Avea, and Jack uh, looking for some help. And so Jack said, hey, I think this sounds like a really great um, uh, theme for the Nature Journaling Educator Forum. So we've been chatting with Lindsay. Um, she's uh, slightly new to Nature Journaling, but she's been doing it a lot with her kiddos. Um, and last uh, fall, she start our led one group session. And so she'd really like to do that again this fall, but she's feeling a little bit overwhelmed in terms of like where to start. So she's looking to hopefully get us to sort of help her figure out some really great introductory lessons that she can do with these kiddos and their parents will be there as well. So we have to add that into the mix, um, as well as just some overall group organization and leadership with um, her club that she's starting. Um, but I'll introduce her uh, again, and then she can give us a little bit more information. So without further ado, Lindsay. <laughs> Hi. Um, first of all, I'm not very good at Zoom, so I apologize. Hopefully I'll get better. Um, so first of all, I'm really, really honored to be here and talk with all of you. I mean, this is an incredible opportunity. And so thank you, first of all, for, for doing this. Um, so... My story um, started homeschooling a couple years ago, and I have always loved, uh, had a really deep appreciation for the natural world um, growing up on the coast of North Carolina, um, but I never learned to nature journal per se. I would just sketch stuff. Um, and then when my kid, when I started homeschooling, I, uh, my kids and I, we bought these nature journals from a um, an online program we found and we just started doing it um, not the same way that I've there's just seems to be a lot of ways to go about it but we enjoyed it so much and they enjoyed being with me doing it and um, it was like a really sweet time with me and my kids um, and my kids are like huge nature buffs so they're always outside collecting stuff and catching frogs and turtles and fish and um they really love it. So anyway, that's what started uh, the interest. And then um, we started doing homeschool with classical conversations, with, which is a classical um, homeschool. Uh, they're all over the world, actually. We're in Eastern Shore of Maryland. Um, so uh, we have of a lot out here. Um, we're near Annapolis, but we're kind of detached from Annapolis. And there's just a, there's a lot of, um, I call it the land of birds because there's just so many types of birds out here. Um, so classical conversations last year, they do cycles. There's three cycles of information the kids basically go through. So last year was cycle one, next year will be cycle two. Last year, was botany and um, animal sciences. So they learned classifying um, types of leads, leaves. Um, they learned plant systems, parts of a plant, seed plants, this kind of thing. They memorized information basically because it is a classical type of thing. So anyway, I'm trying to get around to what um, this point. So um, it lent itself to nature journaling because they were learning about these things. Um, and I just volunteered how many of you, I got up at assembly and said, how many of you would want to do this? And there was probably about 15 to 20 that were interested, um, fam families. Um, so we did about five different, I organized five different meetups last fall through the winter. The first one was a zoo. The second one, um, we went to a um, another type zoo, actually, it was a preserve. The next one, we went to a trail. The next one at the environmental center near us hosted us and did this really cool thing. And then we nature journaled after it. Um, and then there was like one other one where it was just a trail. Um, but the age bracket is um, because it's families meeting together one day a week. Um, it's probably the ages of those that participated were roughly seven to 13 years old, which obviously is a, a large age bracket.
but of the ones that actually journaled, I would say they were around like seven to around 13 that I, I had there as interested. Now this can change because every year the community changes a little bit. It's not like a, a school where <clears throat> you, you have the same kids every year. Um, the moms would be there and they were interested in doing it with their kids. A lot of them purchased journals. They asked me what to get. Again, I kind of just looked online and um, I have just, have just started looking at John Miro Laws and um, all this stuff. I got really overwhelmed. I'm still overwhelmed because as a homeschool parent, which I think there's a lot of us out there, um, I'm trying to learn how to homeschool and it's been that in itself is one thing. So um, I really want to see this through. I just need some guidance because I think if I had a structure just at the beginning, it would make me feel more confident. But my drawing skills are not awesome yet because I've kind of fallen off the wagon. I used to do a lot of drawing and I just haven't. And so I've gotten kind of I go out in my garden and sketch, but I definitely it's nothing I would want to show to anybody. Um, I want to do it more from an education standpoint to really have them look at the world around them and be like, wow, this is amazing. I mean, I see, I, I, I go out in my garden every day and I'm just amazed by just the miracles that are everywhere around me. Um, so I'm asking, can, can you please just give me ideas on how do I structure the time? Um, do, we, do we journal while we're there? Do I send them home with their journal? Do we, I don't know. I mean, it's, what do you do in the winter when it's cold? Um, Cause we're on the Eastern shore of Maryland. So it, you know, we have some pretty cold weather. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm just open to any suggestions, really. I hope that made sense. I'm not the best speaker, so. You, know. you did a great job. That was amazing. You totally did a great job. There's already people in the chat um, that are saying you're doing a great job. So confidence, confidence. We all have imposter syndrome, every single one of us. Um, and I think the first thing that everyone's going to tell you is that it's not about a pretty picture. There is some of us in this group who are very good artists, and there is some of us in the group who are not, and that is okay, right? So it's not about a pretty picture and coming at it from an education standpoint is exactly where you need to be coming from it. Sometimes it'll turn into a pretty picture and sometimes it won't and none of that really matters. It's about the process. So I just wanna refine a couple things before we sort of release everybody. Would it help for us to start, like, are you comfortable and less overwhelmed with how to manage your group and the things that you need? before going into lessons or which one would you like us to sort of focus on a little bit more? Or are you um, looking for both? I, I think maybe the management, like how to go, just how to go about it logistically. Yeah, um, okay, great. So let's start with that. We'll do some logistics. We talked a little bit about this actually last week as well. Um, so hopefully we'll have that up on the website uh, uh, for you soon. Uh, we did sort of like a kickoff to summer, sort of talking about all of the different things that you would need to sort of feel in a happy space for summer. So that would be one that I would recommend you watching. Um, and it's already up on the website. We did one in the winter time, uh, specifically about nature journaling in the winter as well. Um, okay. I also have very cold climate <laughs> where I live as well. Um, and so that is also something that you could watch and would sort of give you some tips and tricks, but we can sort of do that. So I'm thinking that maybe if we get everybody to start in sort of logistics, right? I know Kate and Aisha for sure, and Avea, and there's a few other, and Susan's a teacher. Um, Sarah, I can't remember if Sarah's a teacher or not or runs courses, but definitely some of us here are uh, managed kiddos. And so I think that we can start off with some logistics on just sort of how that kind of rolls out. And then we can sort of go into some lesson kind of ideas. Does that sort of make sense to everybody? Maybe everybody give me a thumbs up if that makes sense. I'm seeing head shakes of people saying yes. Okay, sweet. All right, so let's do that. Um, yeah, who wants to get started? They can raise their hand and we will invite you into the spotlight. Anybody want to go first? Oh, look at there, I'll be shy. Maybe Kate wants to go. 
everybody's being shy. You know, Kate's got something to say. Come on, Kate. There we go. I knew Kate would chime in. There we go. I'm going to add Kate into the spotlight. So, Lindsay, just so you know who Kate is, she uh, hails from Hawaii, um, and uh, she has lots of stuff with kiddos. So, she'll be a great person to chat with to get us started. Thanks, Kate. Yeah, this is so, um, this is so in my kind of <laughs> my realm. Um, I have been I started a club out here for families, and then I also have a club, but I mostly just have, um, most of what I do is I mentor um, a group of fifth graders. So my daughter, we homeschooled her, um, not this past year, but a year before. And so we kind of got into that mindset. And so I just kind of collect neighborhood kids that are all, that she's like, gets along with. And we're like, let's go nature journaling. Oh. And um, I, I've found, because it's all, so that's a very different kind of beast because that's, they're all the same age and they all kind of feed off of each other and inspire each other. And so one is like, Hey, a chicken. And then they all go running off. And then I'm like, okay, let's draw the chicken. And I don't have to give them a whole lot of guidance. Um, they just start going and I'm like, how about we label or color, you know, and then they just, they just kind of take it on their own. Um, so that's one thing you can do too, is trying to find, you know, similar age groups, um, I don't know if that's an option for you, but then I am also trying to keep, start up a family group for homeschooling and um, just different families around. And so we've met up at, um, we've even just met up at like playgrounds <laughs> before um, and parks and different things like that. And yeah, um, yeah. and so at, when there's too much interest going on that I do find that the kids kind of tend to scatter and just want to explore and do their own thing. Um, but it's this wonderful opportunity to sit down with the parents. Uh, some projects that I've done are like, you know, blind contour drawing, or um, we do, I've done a lot of negative space work where you try to draw like the negative space of trees. Um, you don't draw the tree, you draw everything but the tree. Okay. Um, or you draw like the negative space of clouds and those kind of activities to kind of loosen up um, or just choosing, choosing a flower off the ground and, you know, drawing it and you know, doing a simple watercolor set. And then I do find that the kids will come over and be like, oh, what are you guys doing? You know, and, um, but so that's a more casual way of doing it. But what sounds like you're doing is much more structured and organized, which is great. And something like I'm aspiring to as well. And so I've been trying to collect some different types of lessons that work. Um, it is hard with a very mixed age group because there is so much different levels of focus and interest and you can't really just be like, okay, everybody just do what you want because the kids want to play and then the adults are you know, shy. Um, and so the lesson that I've created is the magic eight. Um, I don't know if you've seen that posted. I can share that with you. Um, and it is, I have, I have everybody draw eight shapes on their page. And then there's a um, like quick intro lesson for to fill each shape. So you do metadata, you do a you know small landscape, you draw, and it's they're all very quick five minute lessons, and so it is very flexible depending on age and ability um, because it's not super long and it's not like okay we're gonna spend this whole time learning about landscapes, which doesn't really work for like a seven year old who has a short attention span or a thirteen year old who might just start like getting kind of bored or. Um, because, you know, I don't know, they, they get like uncomfortable or they're not happy with the way it's turning out. Um, I find that really quick um, activities. Um, so that's, it's a list of, you know, eight common um, activities when and it that, takes about an I, hour. I hmm? missed, I, you, my internet connection went out when you said what that was called, that eight minute. Oh, okay, yeah, it's called the, the magic eight. So it's eight that's different that's lessons. And I can, um, I'll make sure I, I can link to that in the chat when I'm not talking. <laughs> I can find the thing and I'll, I'll add it. It's a Google doc, um, that's a shared one. Um, so something like that, um, I've done, um, I, I, so I am doing it, as I said, like a little bit more formal, but um, I've, I've had the challenge sometimes. And so I'm actually opening up to the group is that when I do have parents, sometimes they really wanna talk <laughs> and they really wanna, they, they just want to, they're so excited, especially homeschooling parents sometimes. I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but they're just like, oh, other parents and they're chatting and yeah. then the kids start chatting and you're like, okay, guys, we're like here to do something. <laughs> oh, that's, yeah. I mean, yeah, we're in the, we're in the homeschooling community. So there's a big social aspect to it, but yeah, keeping the attention of everybody is really difficult, especially on a trail because they're running around, they're catching stuff, looking at stuff. 
I would have them put like interesting things in a bag to take back with them to journal. I don't know if that's a good idea, but that's no, one that's thing. Um, yeah, that's so a really good idea is what I was gonna say is, you know, like collecting things along the way and then having certain spots where you're like, okay, now we're gonna all sit down and having snacks or water time where everybody lays everything out. And then once everybody's kind of sitting down, then you have kind of these ideas and experiences that you can gather and work on then. Um, yeah, so Yvette, do you wanna talk about routine? Cause this, so I, I, I'm kind of rambling here because this is something that I like, this brings up so many thoughts and ideas of things, how I wanna um, improve my own um, teaching and club experiences that I have. So yeah. Um I just, I already agree with everything that you're saying. Um, one thing I found helpful with creating routine is, is you put down kind of a list of what elements that you want to have. Um, and then, then that, that's when you kind of organize them into what makes the most sense. Um, so like, for example, I used to um, teach preschoolers gardening. And so I knew that I wanted some part of it that would let them draw a, a bit, even if they couldn't do like specific nature journaling yet. Although I wanted to at least give them the opportunity of beginning to put what they saw on paper. I also wanted a part of it to be really hands-on because I knew that as little kids, they were gonna have a lot of energy. Um, and, and so just knowing those parts of it, then I could say, okay, we're gonna do just one main theme a day, but the theme is gonna have both of these elements to it. And so then I could decide whether, usually it was that they would do the thing and then they would um, draw afterwards. And then I thought that while they were drawing, then for the kids who got finished too early, then I could read um, I, I had a bunch of kids books, so then I could read to them at least a couple of stories um, that had to do with the theme of the day. And so, and so having, and so the theme could change, but then having the routine of one thing that's hands-on, um, drawing time, and then also reading a story at, that, that was set, set for that age group helped. And then, and then at certain points I could add in extra things like that they could make things and take them home. Um, and so one thing is when we lead nature journaling outings. Um, Internet. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so, so one thing I found is when we lead nature drawing outings, I've watched Jack do this a lot, and he seems to have a routine as well, where he gives people enough time to show up, then he does a quick little mini lesson, and usually he has one um, tool that he offers people. So instead of having to inundate with all of the tools, even though you can, you know that he'd be excited enough to do so if people like keep asking him questions, he, he focuses on one tool. So maybe today he's going to talk about the zoom in, zoom out. And so then he'll talk about overall nature journaling and then he'll say, okay, so suppose that you want to, and, he's, and he starts out with a question. So he says, suppose that there's this big thing that you're trying to look at and it's a bit overwhelming. Let's zoom into one part that's interesting, or maybe we're looking at this thing and then we want to zoom out and see the big picture. And so then he'll demonstrate a little bit of how to do that. And then he'll issue a suggestion that people might find that, but that overall follow their curiosity. So so for him, the, um, the routine is give people time to arrive, um, do a mini lesson th that offers a specific um, solution, then give people sort of a, a, the talk about, you know, go follow your curiosity and like sort of the, the motivational talk where you, where you go out to do that. And then a certain amount of time where you go out and explore and then people reunite to eat lunch and then we share our journals and sometimes it's usually some form of that. And sometimes there's more to add on in the afternoon. Um, but that way having that consistent routine helps us, um, with what we come to, uh, just we have, we always know what to expect. And I do a similar thing with plant families and our foods as well. Um, so that's just. A, yeah. I'm curious, oh. like time frame wise on this, what is a good time for all this occur? Like how long should a session be? Well, that's what I was just going to suggest to you is that maybe your first meetup is a little less about the nature journaling and a little bit more of getting to know one another and figuring out your goals. So maybe you come together and you sort of do that 10 minutes, everybody's coming, get some water, you know, have some social time. And then maybe you sit down as the group and sort of get the group to decide on what their goals for this are going to be. Is the goal to learn how to draw? Is the goal to spend time in nature? Is the goal to learn how to nature journal? Like what are the sort of the goals? And then that will be able to sort of help you get a routine like Avea and Kate are mentioning to sort of set you up for success. And then you become less of the person who's like, we're doing stuff and more like, okay, so the next part of our goals was that we, you know, all agreed that we were going to spend 
a half an hour sitting and drawing once we were, you know, a half an hour into our hike or whatever it is. So by having the group set up those group goals and those group norms, you become less of that like person that's trying to tell everybody what to do. And you become more of the facilitator who's just saying, hey, I'm just going to facilitate what we all decided as one big group. And then you can really start to implement, I think, in those um, routines and then it becomes a little bit flowy like everybody's like oh yeah we agreed that this is this is how much time we were going to spend so maybe it's two hours by the time you add lunch in and you add in a hike and you add in a little social time and you add in some nature drilling time two hours is going to fly by pretty quickly so maybe yeah. it's two hours to start with a lunch break and maybe you all agreed that you're going to have two 15 minute breaks on either side of that 50, you know that half an hour lunch or whatever it is you're going to do and maybe you're not journaling during lunch maybe you're having social time at lunch and to get your willies and sillies out so that we're then back to focusing on the nature journaling after lunch right so I think it's going to be really group dependent on what your routine is going to look for but if there's some of these things that you can kind of take from us to kind of keep in mind um, you know, would be good. Making sure that they have lots of snacks, making sure that there's lots of water, making sure that, you know, they're comfortable. I'm assuming where you are is very similar climate to me. So there's probably mosquitoes and ticks and all those kinds of things, right? So how are we going to make sure that everybody is comfortable and that we're feeling good? And that I also find with kiddos that I work with, if they know when they're going to eat, then they tend to ask me less often about, are we ready to eat yet? right? Or when's lunch? If they know, or if they have snacks handy, then that's really easy for you to sort of move on from that, if that sort of helps. Um, Aisha has her hand up as well. So I'm going to bring her into the spotlight, but go ahead if you've got something to say, and we'll, we'll bring Aisha into the mix as well. Well, I was just going to ask real quick. So is a good time frame to go through lunch or after lunch? And do, I mean, do most groups do that or... I find when the students come to me at the field centers, I find for um, younger kids that they are better in the morning than they are by the afternoon. So for me, like the earlier you can start, like, you know, obviously we don't want to be getting up at some kind of crazy hour, but like, you know, like a nine o'clock start and maybe you're ending with lunch as a social time and you're having some breaks in between. If you're trying to nature journal with kiddos in the afternoon and that's your start time, I think you're going to find it really difficult to get them like settled because they're hot, they're tired by then, their brains are already switching into something different. That's my experience. I see the other teachers in the crowd going, yes. Um, so I would say you would want to be morning. That's also cooler temperatures, especially when we're talking about summer. So that that's what I would do is I would go earlier morning, if that helps. Okay. Okay, Aisha, you're up for it. Do we unmute you? Yeah, thanks. Okay, yay. <laughs> oh, we just lost somebody. Who was it, Ivea? <laughs> I was like, oh, um, and Kate. Um, yeah, what was I going to add to that? You guys covered a lot of things, but a few thoughts came to mind again. You know, just like you were saying, get everybody comfortable. I was thinking, you know, if you don't know about Maslow's Pyramid, Make sure that, um, you know, you're starting with everybody thinking through how to keep everybody physically comfortable, whatever that is in whatever season, right? So if you got that and kind of they've, you know, discovered that um, that's most important for any human. And then next thing you're figuring out, are they going to be emotionally comfortable? Is there anything you need to that they need to know that it's it's safe it's a safe walk it's a safe place or they'll be able to eat when they were hungry will they be able to go to the bathroom when they're hungry when they need to um whatever the issues might be with the age group because it sounds like you have a mix so we can't give one answer because it's gonna vary with each age and with parents i wanted to add with parents i did a lot of field trips and i taught preschool through elementary for many years, both on campus, outside and on field trips. I finally learned to be a little bit more direct with the parent chaperones who were along, which was hard for me, but to just say, this is not a talking time. If you really need to chat with another parent, please move away from the group. 
um, because we're going to have a lesson and we need everybody to model. And it took me a while. And I also learned to have a little chat with the parents separately at the beginning, away from the kids and set expectations with them just as I did with the students. And if you're a home community, homeschooling community, you might want to discuss those more as a group rather than one person setting the expectations. But that really helps because they don't know. Nobody knows, right? Um, mm -hmm. And what was I going to say? That was my thing about parents. The other thing I found that really helped was um, like the, all the routines, like Avea said, if you have find a routine that works and can repeat it and explaining the routine to the students at the beginning, like we are gonna walk a bit and we're gonna stop a few times. And I would let them know my attention getting signal for when we stopped and the rest of the time they can chit chat with each other because you're not gonna keep everybody quiet. And I don't do walking, talking lessons because it just, it just didn't work. So it'd be like set of places, we'll stop to look at something or gather something, right? It's some attention signal. A lot of teachers use quiet coyote, but there's other things. There's little call and responses you know, whatever, whatever works for you. I had a teacher who always was like, when I say green, you say beans, green beans, you know, and, and I would, I turned that into redwoods because they're redwoods near us. So uh, when I say red, you say wood, redwood, bird calls, you know, whatever. So they know that until then they can be doing their thing. And when that happens, everybody comes together for a mini, whatever, um, the only other thing I want, want to suggest, because there's no one single intro lesson. I mean, it's really kind of also what calls to you, I think, as an educator, where you start and like, you know, several people already put in the chat, there's the fabulous guide already that they've put together, Jack and Emily on the intro to nature journaling. But I did find that repetition was really useful with a group new to it. I didn't throw a new thing at them each time we gathered. We spent a lot of time just letting them get really comfortable. Like, oh, I'm going to know, do an I notice, I wonder, reminds me of, or just I notice with younger kids and then add to it very slowly and sense my group's energy. When were they ready for more rapid new things? And when? Yeah, go ahead, Lindsay. Um, so... I'm just thinking like maybe we can use one of my experiences and you can kind of help me like so you're you're on a trail and you're walking you know you're hiking when do you do the uh, I notice or I wonder you know um you could either just say when we stop we stop and now we're going to journal and that would be you choosing a place that looks like everybody will be comfortable they're out yeah. of the sun or they're in the sun or they're out of the wind or they're in the wind, you know, whatever is needed. So that might change. You're going to need, you know, you'll develop a sense of favorite trails or places or, and something that's there's interesting. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I think to begin, there'll have to be definitely some mini lessons like you, like um, if you was saying after you arrived, because these kids, um, a lot of them, I, I mean, we, we have a wide variety, some that have been homeschooled a while, some that are straight out of public school, some that are, it's all a mixed bag. Um, but I've found that kids are very, um, they're not very confident drawing. They're not even confident writing because they do so much on the computer. Um, yeah. And that's mm -hmm. one motivation I have is because I think kids nice. need to do this more. They don't put a pen to paper enough. Um, so there's a confidence issue where it was kind of turning into more of a real art lesson um, where I was having to really, and part of our homeschool, we talk about drawing, paying attention to shapes, the five elements of drawing and, and all that. And we, they, they're, they're schooled in that, but they don't spend a lot of time doing it. So the nature journaling kind of forces them to do it. Um, but so one I think thing that comes to mind, and I don't know what you th others think, is that um, then you pick the subject mm -hmm. the first few times, right? And make it very simple, like a leaf. Yeah. 
okay. or something very simple that they can develop some confidence and you're just sort of encouraging, you know, even a limit of how many words or something. And like, I think Ivea was putting this in your chat, but I've often done just the, I notice practice verbally and they share it in the whole group or they partner up and they learn to articulate what they see. And then they start getting excited about that. And then, then we're like, okay, we're gonna put that to paper. So, yeah, so I, would, I, I would say really emphasizing the diagram as opposed to drawing a picture. And so Kate put that in the chat and I think that's what Aisha was getting to. And I see lots of people, that's what we always talk about is it's really like if you're looking at a leaf, like look at it as a diagram. So like if you're 13 and you're doing your science and you're making a diagram, that's when you're gonna be adding labels to it. You're adding arrows to it. So it's not about, you know, making this leaf that looks super realistic. It's about noticing what's on the leaf. Um, and the other thing too, is that they can do, they can trace it. There's nothing wrong with them tracing the leaf, sticking it right on their paper. They can also do leaf rubbing, which is where you put the underneath the paper with the crayon and then you put it over top, magically it happens. So there's nothing wrong with doing any of those things, but really focusing on the fact that it's not about a pretty picture, that you are using the picture to help your brain remember what you saw. And then you're gonna add the words okay. and the numbers to facilitate that picture. Because if you just have a picture, then it's just a picture, right? So when you add the labels to say like, this part was brown and this part was green and this part has a hole in it. And you know, this part was see-through or whatever. You're now starting to add all those little pieces together. And so it becomes less about like this gorgeous, um, picture, but really about what you're seeing in that moment in your thought process. So that's one of the ways that I try with kiddos to get around that is to really say the picture is just one little part of this whole, you know, magical piece. Um, uh, and I was going to say something, Kate, I see you as well. So we'll get you, um, well, Kate into here. I see your hand up. Yeah, go and, ahead. Lindsay. Yeah. One more thing I was going to say to that is like, I will concretely say, this is not an art class. Mm -hmm just spell it out. Like maybe we will further develop some skills in an art class session, but this is, we're not doing art right now. We're, we're nature journaling and we're gonna do some drawing and some writing and some labeling and, you know, pull in all these different skills, but, you know. Go ahead, Lindsay, I think I, think I cut you off. <laughs> yeah, sorry. My internet's bad, I'm trying to. We can hear you if that helps. Action. Hello. Yeah. Um, kind of interesting being here yesterday. I took some 13 year old boys on a trip to the zoo and listening to the whole things about uh, when is lunch and um, getting kids engaged. Definitely. It's a thing. Um, I've been lucky to work with like two age groups. One's like the 13 year old boys. The other was an amazing group of fifth grade girls who just, I could not have asked for like an easier, more engaged group of kids. And then the boys are just like the complete opposite of that. I like them both. They're both great, but it was so interesting like seeing how those like dynamics work, especially with the amount of kids too. Um, Cause like when you have like two guys it was just two of them. I took them for one of their birthdays and um, the whole time it was much more about like trying to manage them. It's like, okay, come on guys, don't be obnoxious to other people. Don't be obnoxious on the animals. And then like, instead of just like going, okay, we've seen it, let's move on be like, okay, well, I'm gonna sit here in nature journal. So why don't we like talk about what we see and what we like? I mean, like we're here because this is like a learning experience and it's interesting to see all these animals, but why are we just gonna go running past? And then there was the girls who were so amazing. <laughs> um, Cause like we do stuff where I could have these really amazing flexible lesson plans where I'd bring something and be like, okay, I've got a few tricks in my pocket. Let's see like what the kids energy is today and what they wanna do. Cause they were so like agreeable and like, okay, let's go for a hike. Let's see something interesting and um, you know, like as long as I kind of match their energy, like they would sit in nature journal if I asked them to, if they're really high energy, but sometimes they're just bouncing off the wall and I could tell they like wanted to play and wanted to talk to each other. I'd be like, okay, well, you know, 
I really like utilizing games. Like we had a great relay race one that was about salmon. I had a tag game that was about sharks managing fish viruses or sharks impact on fish viruses um, and finding like little ways to give them outlets instead of like going against the grain with like the kids clearly have like a want or need. And if I push fully against it, that's going to not work well for me. And then I'm going to be fighting to keep their attention and get them engaged with what I want them engaged with. So, yeah. That's tough. Yeah. Yeah. I can explain the shark one really quick. It's super easy. And it's a great way to burn off energy on kids, even in like fairly small space. If they can run, you start off the game where you have um, one person being the virus and one person being the shark and then everyone else is fish. And then the shark and the virus race to try and like infect or eat most people. Um, yeah, it's a little messy, but basically you just sort of like set a time limit on it. The kids run around like crazy. And then you like increase the amount of sharks or the amount of viruses. And then like they watch how it uh, affects the population. Or they just have to tag people to get them out? Basically, or? Tag. Yeah, yeah. I think there was some rule about like, you can only walk if you're an infected fish. So of course the infected fish get eaten by the sharks. Um, but yeah. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> very silly. Just like, if you just make up stuff that like has a very simple mechanism, but gives them an outlet to do things. Yeah. And, like they were still talking about the sharks and stuff. And then they'd be like, oh, Kate, can we play the shark game? Like, I love that you remember that. So go for it, you know? Um, yeah, I need some games to do like that to break it up. Yeah. Uh, so you you had the nature journal, like while you were looking at the animals. Um, the other thing I've run into a lot is questions about what they're looking at. And obviously we, most of us have a smartphone so we could look it up, but that distracts from what you're doing. And so this is something I've struggled with because for instance, my kids and I, we went out looking for mushrooms. We got all these books about mushrooms from the library, did not realize like at all how complicated it really is to identify a mushroom. Um, and, you know, like, we're not, we're never going to have the resources we need there in the woods. I think my problem is I've been focusing too much on what we're looking at and not just observing it. Like you were saying, like really, really writing down what you're observing. And then later, later you could, when you're at home, you know, really figure that out maybe. Yeah. Well, on one hand, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I carry field guides with me too, but almost all the time that what we're looking at is not in the field guide. It's like not in there. So like the pocket ones, not the. the oh, okay. Cause I, there's a couple things like sometimes you can find like semi laminated ones or I just get old used field guides and I just I'm like, you know what? They're going to die. So it's fine. Cause if I can hand that to a kid and go like, Hey, why don't you like, you know, here's how you use it. Why don't you try and find it? And like, that's a really great tool. You just have to have sacrificial field guides. The other thing is just like, as you said, focus on like, observe what we see instead of just trying to put a label on it. Because they, a lot of kids would ask me, especially insects. Yeah. They'll say, oh, hey, what is that? Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. know. I mean, or Hang on. types of There's... trees. I mean, these are all things I really want to know more about, but yeah. I don't. So you don't, you don't have to be my go-to answer always is, I don't know. What do well, you think it is? Man, you're breaking up again. Um, right? What do you think it is? Yeah. The other great lesson there is like, you can break that up into like learning opportunities where you teach people to identify things like Yvea does their plant families class by doing groups and basically go like, okay, well, you know, I don't know what it is exactly, but that tree has needles. So it's not a deciduous tree. And it shows like these different types of things. So you can talk about like that sort of thing and then you can feel like, okay, we don't know what it is, but we know that it's an evergreen tree. We know that because like, it's got this, you know, like pine cones or looks like it has scorch marks or something like that. You can like find things to like tell about that and add to like its story. Um, 
instead of it just being like, I don't know, it's a tree. It's like, oh, well, it's this tree. It does this. Like, that's what we can tell about it. And just trying to identify it without a name. Another thing that I find really helps is to have a really solid lesson with the whole I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. Although mm -hmm. occasionally I'll do something kind of sacrilegious and I'll, and I'll switch the it reminds me of and the I wonder. Because then if I start by doing I notice. And then, for example, earlier today, we were talking about a group of flowers and some of them have a little cup-like thing on them. There is a vocab word for that. But Hypanthium. Yep, the hypanthium. Nice, you remembered. <laughs> yes, the hypanthium. And so, but the thing is that if you don't know that word, then you could just say, huh, um, I noticed that there is this little thing that's beneath the sepals and the petals. It reminds me of a cup. And so then you, from there you question, I wonder why it has that. I wonder if there's something special inside. And so sometimes I like to do that. I like to switch up the I wonder and the it reminds me of, because then the it reminds me of um, can help put words to things that you don't have vocab for. Because like, like Rebecca and Jack like to say, the it reminds me of is connecting something new that you're saying to a story that you already have in your brain. It's connecting the familiar with the new. And so um, the familiar might already have words that you that you ascribe to it. And so that that can be what helps you to, to put names for the things that you don't have the actual names for, um, just as a thought with that. Um, okay. I want, yes. sorry. Um, I was just gonna say one more quick thing. Um, and, then, and then I see a bunch of people are gonna, sorry, um, is that, in addition to the whole drawing um, and making the drawing a diagram, um, one thing I found that helps is that if you have a um, source for like a, a whiteboard or a drawing board that's big enough for them to see is not only to demonstrate it and by doing that then to just do like the most uncareful fast drawing possible because then you can just show people that it's just like, oh, that it can yeah. be figures. But then the other thing is that it's fun to demonstrate for them on that big board a blind contour drawing because then everybody relaxes when you show people a blind contour drawing. Um, and then you can tell people what you noticed in that. You say, okay, so maybe of course it doesn't fit together, but you notice how I might've sort of overemphasized the leaf margins on this thing to be really spiky. Maybe I didn't notice how spiky these leaf margins really were until I did the blind contour. And so that's another really, really low stress way of helping people who might be drawing reluctant. Um, and I'm gonna pass it on to Billy, Joe, Kate Chandler, and, and we'll, Kate. Yeah, we'll bring Kate back in too. Um, so one thing I just wanted to mention with when they ask that question, like, what is this or why is it doing this? And my response always is, I don't know, what do you think? Even if I know the answer, even if I know the scientific answer, because I want that to be an opportunity for them to come up with the possibilities. So that I turn it back on them and use that as a great place for me to have a conversation with them. So I'll be like, I don't know what it is. What do you think? And then they'll say, well, I'm not sure. And I'm like, well, what do you notice about it? Kind of going on what Kate Chandler was saying, right? Like, well, is it an evergreen or is it a deciduous tree? What are you noticing about it? Does it remind you of anything? So maybe if it's a maple leaf, I'm like, does it remind you of something? And then they're like, oh, it's on the Canadian flag. And I'm like, right, you know, what are we famous for in Canada? And they're like, oh, maple syrup. And I'm like, oh, right. And so really using that as an opportunity to have a great conversation. So it doesn't even matter if I know what the name of the tree is. It doesn't, it doesn't matter because if I just tell them, like Jack always says, if I just tell them the answer, then the conversation's over. And they're like, oh, it's a maple tree. And then they move on. But that's not what we want them to do. We want them to go deeper into that and really to explore that investigation part of it. Me telling them the answer isn't helping them learn. It's just telling them the right answer. It's no different than going to Google and being like, what is this? And then Google tells us and we all go, mm, now I know the answer. Right, well, we didn't learn anything about that. So I always use those opportunities to be like, let's do this, right? Get on the ground with them. What are you seeing? What are you noticing? Turn it over. What does it remind us of? And sometimes with their questions, I want them to be like, what do you think? Like, what could the possibilities be? So if they're saying like, I don't know, why is the this leaf green or whatever? Okay, well, what do you know about leaves that are green? And then I get them to sort of like mind map it off that question and then say, okay, go back and look. And like, you know, somebody painting it, like, well, does that kind of make sense? Well, not really. So they can kind of, you know, figure out like they can disprove um, some of their possibilities just with their own observation. So I let them just really go wild in that spot and then kind of come back and say, okay, what do I really know? And then be like, maybe it's this thing that I remember from grade three called chlorophyll. And then, you know, maybe it's this, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm like, 
Mm, interesting. And don't tell them the answers. You don't need to be a scientist. You don't need to be an expert. You just need to know how to ask questions back at them. That's really one of the big things that you need to sort of be able to do. Okay. In, in my yeah, opinion with me anyways. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Kate. So second Kate. Kate Richter. <laughs> No, um, I was going to say like, it's what you said, but so Coyote's Guide to Mentoring talks a lot about that, about um, guiding them with questions instead of just trying to have that answer. And so saying like, instead of being like, so it's a pine tree because of X, Y, Z, you say, oh, you know, well, you know, if it was a pine tree, these are some things that we would see. Do you see those things? You know, and, and having those sort of categories. Um, and then also they talk a lot about having field guides like back at the car um, so that you're required to try to record as much information in the field as you can. And so I found that really effective with birds in particular because they're gone so quickly that you spend your whole time um, trying to identify, like looking at the field guide instead of looking at the bird. And so I have them say out loud and I actually pair them up when we're working on with birds. And so one person is recording and the other person is describe like looking and describing and they say, okay, I see a bird. It's about this big, what color, you know, it's got a red head and it's got, you know, big long legs. It's in the water. It's doing this. Oh, now another one has come. And trying to like describe and the other person's trying to write and record and draw as much as possible about what they see. And then, um, and it's just like, you're really quick. And it's all about just trying to gather as much information about the bird, just so you can remember what you saw. And so teaching those like that, the, the metacognition as <laughs> you know, Jack always talks about is um, how do I, how do I do that act of identifying um, and same thing with bugs, because I'm always trying to identify the bugs that I have in my garden. And so I'll take, I have a gardening journal and I take it out and I try to record as much information as I can about the bug. And then I come inside and I, you know, and then I look it up. Um, and then if you can collect samples or something in the field too, that's really fun to look under a microscope <laughs> if that's, um, a, if it's yeah. like something really yeah. tiny, um, but really trying to get in the, in the habit of like, while they're out there you're not like researching you're not looking up you're not identifying you're just observing um and i'm i guess my question for you too to think about is to like talk to other people who do classical conversations because i'm not sure like i know i my my friend has done that and has like led a group and so i know that's a lot of the classical conversations is a lot about like memorizing information and you know, yeah. and so this is, this is like a very different way of approaching information. So, um, and it's a very way, different way of approaching that sort of learning. Um, but I did study Leonardo da Vinci. I don't know if he comes up in classical conversations, but he's like a great example of somebody who just is curious and is just, I mean, his notebooks are filled with like all these random things yes. that he's um, wondering about, you know? And so kind of that sort of attitude of like, um, of how do I just like identify as much as possible. And so then, then you can go back and find experts and find, you know, and find those books and stuff. Um. I kind of have a technique for engaging kids with something like that, that it, I don't know, I've gotten some negative feedback from that. The thing I started doing at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, I was a volunteer there for a while and I was spent a lot of time working the touch tanks. And half of that is convincing children to pet uh, marine invertebrates, which, you know, for kids that aren't like nature kids, if you ask them to stick their hand in cold water and pet a uh, sea cucumber, they look at you like you're crazy, which, you know, maybe you are. You're the one standing back there with all the marine invertebrates. But what I would do is I would give them all like human sounding names and I'd be like oh do you want to meet my friend this is Fred this is like so and so and then the kids would get very interested and then once like they were interested in like oh this is Fred like Fred is a decorator crab he has a very like sticky shell and he'll put like pieces of algae on there and then they'll kind of like get interested um I've had some work with now I met him when he was 11 and I think I kind of got him started on that because even now like we'll be out somewhere and we'll see something and he will in addition to wanting to like identify the animal if we see a bird he gives the bird a name like all the time it's kind of funny like it, I did see that they names they name everything yeah but it's great because then especially like if you have things that you see regularly like we have a great blue heron that's out of the barn that I ride at and 
the kid that I teach, he lives there. So he'd be like, oh, Kate, Fred's here, or Fred was hunting tadpoles, or I saw Fred do this and this and this. I'm like, that is great, Alex, you know, thank you. Um, so, you know, sometimes you just, if it's silly, if it's not scientific, sometimes it works. Yeah, thank you. Um, going off of what Kate just said, for the younger kids, we did an activity where we named them, but we came up with names, like not like Fred and stuff, but came up with names based on their adaptations. Oh. So if you had a salamander, for instance, and you were like, well, what do I notice about its adaptations? Well, it has yellow spots. It has slimy sort of skin or whatever it is. So then you make up a name that's like slimy spotted four-legged or whatever it is, right? So you kind of come up with these names because now they're observing the adaptation yeah. and giving it this really cool kind of creative name, which then also gives them a really fun title for their nature journaling page as well. So that could be like a minds on, you know, kind of fun as well. Um, and you could do that with any age, but like little kids really love to do that as well. But let's be honest, everybody does. Oh, we, <laughs> we, did that with, um, we did that with dinosaurs, but we took it a whole nother level where we had all the Latin terms oh. for like, so like long legged or tall or big or spotted. And so we were able to use like Latin or Greek terms um, to, and so now, so we started doing that where we try to use like the Latin prefixes and suffixes, and then you put them together um, to create like your own kind of Latin name for for the plant or animal, um, but that requires <laughs> that sort of like that list that you have, um, but that would really, um, but yeah, absolutely. Like that, I forgot to say, that's one of the things we did with the birds is that after they kind of described as much as possible, then they came up with a name for it. And so then it really became personal when they did go to look it up is that they were like, oh yeah, the, the you know, yellow, bell yellow bellied sapsucker is <laughs> actually, the, you know, this is the name that it's called. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's great. Like, so it's super fun. And so one thing I put in the chat was that if you were talking about the questions and them trying to figure out what the answers were, maybe something that you could do with your group as one of your group goals is that the time in between your sessions is that each of those kids had to do research and they have to research the answer to one of their questions. And then maybe that is how you start off your next session is what did you find and did you answer or were you able to figure it out? So again, that might include more of that technique that you're using for the homeschooling um, in terms of that sort of memorization. But then what it does is that they do their nature journal, they go home, you're asking them to relook at that nature journal page again, do research. And then when they come back, you're asking them to do it again. So now they've looked at that nature journaling page at least three times in three different spaces. So you're really starting to get that experience really, you know, cemented in um, for that memorization piece. And then having those names, you know, Abe was putting like the chat's going crazy because everyone's like coming up with funny names for things. But if you're looking at like bald eagles or whatever, and every bald eagle you see maybe is Rachel, then when you hear the name Rachel, you immediately affiliate it with bald eagle, right? And so that's, you know, a really great way to memorize things is when you have that name affiliation, um, which you could do as well. So there's some of those things that I think um, can work really well. And I'm just trying to like look through the chat as like lumpy snake, because it was lumpy. I think somebody put that in that was maybe Aisha or I think that was, maybe it was Susan. Um, it was Susan. Um, so, you know, lots of different things like that, that I think you just really have fun with it. And it also takes a lot of pressure off of you as the facilitator. So for me, my every day is instructing students to come up here to the field center. And I don't like to be like the lecturer at the front of the classroom. Like that's not really why I do what I do. So I try as much as possible to explain what it is we're doing and then put it back on the students. But if you've got those goals, you know what the expectations are, you've sort of outlined all that stuff, then you just get to sort of like move through it and facilitate it as opposed to being like, next on the docket is this. And that's so much pressure on you and it sucks. And if it's so much more free flowing, if you're able to just sort of be in the moment with everybody as well. Yeah, totally. It's more room for discovery too. Yeah, I want it to be more fun and, and not be so, like, I don't need another, 
I, I don't, I just, I need more fun. <laughs> so, yeah, I want to help them, but I, I'm not an expert, obviously. So but I'm, I'm not an expert either. And this is my whole job. I'm not an expert, right? But this is what I get paid to do, but I get paid to add fun and I get paid to like, give them that sense of wonder and curiosity. And I'm there to facilitate that. Like, do I know stuff? Yeah, I know stuff, but I'm not an expert, right? Expert is like, those are pretty big shoes to fill. And right, I'm not prepared in my life to fill the shoes of an expert. What I am prepared to do is fill the shoes of Billy Joe. And so I'm gonna bring what I know to the table. I'm gonna bring my sense of fun and I'm gonna bring my sense of wonder and curiosity. And that's what I'm bringing to the table. And so Lindsay, you just need to figure out your shoes, right? Don't get so sucked into, I don't know the names of all these plants. I don't know the names of all these trees. I don't know them either. I don't, I don't, right? And I don't always necessarily have time to find out all those things, but eventually I'll figure it out, right? But you just need to be fun and give a space. You're creating space. Like if that sort of takes things away from yourself in terms of pressure, you are creating space for them to nature journal, to observe, to wonder, to be curious. That is your job as a facilitator. And your job is to keep them on track for the goals that that group has set. Other than that, you those are the shoes that you are filling. You are not filling a scientist expert shoes. Otherwise, none of us would be doing this, right? Just, I hope that helps a little bit. And Abea, and then I see it, Susan's hand is up as well. It does, it does because a lot of the parents, I don't know, they like assume that because I love to do this stuff that I know like what all the plants are. And <laughs> like, I, it's just, there's a lot of assumptions going on that is just not the way it is. I have a huge appreciation for it. Just like I do music. I don't play the piano. I don't play a single instrument and I can't sing, but I have, have a lot of appreciation for music. Um, so it's kind of similar to that. Um, and that's coming back to what Aisha said, right? It's having a conversation with those parents. And the thing mm -hmm. is, is that you are going to be upfront and say, I am not an expert. I am not a botanist. Mm -hmm. I am yeah. not a forester. I am not a wildlife biologist. But what we are going to do is this. And that is what I'm offering your kiddos. That is it right there. And I think you just need to be really upfront. That will take a huge amount of pressure off of you. And it'll take a huge amount of pressure off of them with expectations as well, right? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I was going to say that on the subject of fun, just the sheer amount of how much the chat really, really like suddenly blew up um, with, with all of us having anecdotes of, um, of times that we've named this plant or this bug or this animal or whatever. I think that that's a pretty clear sign that that a lot of us carry really fond memories of doing that. And so that's definitely an activity that I think is a good one. So, and, and, and Kate had been mentioning it first. So yeah, just maybe some people will frown on it and think don't anthropomorphize nature, but it's less about anthropomorphizing and more about making a connection and making it matter to somebody. Um, so. So I think, yeah, just by the sheer number of us who have fond memories of it, I'd say go for that. And then another thing is that I had a, had a quick question for folks. Um, let's see here. Um, and people can raise their hands if they'd like to. Who here identifies yourself to be, okay, who, who identifies themselves as being a nature expert? Okay, I don't see any hands. Who here identifies themselves as being more of a nature cheerleader than a nature expert? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we can be our nature cheerleaders. Um, and so I think, and so sometimes it's about putting a different term or a different spin on what we do. And, and that is that like we're cheerleaders. Sometimes what we're there to do is to get people excited enough to go and do their own thing with it. Um, one thing I say a lot of times, I have this nickname, as you see, my nickname is Mad Botanist, but for me, I don't identify as a botanist necessarily because of knowing plants. There's a lot of plants I don't know. There's so many families I don't know. There's a lot of plants that completely confound me. There's plant knowledge I don't have. But what makes me a botanist is my enthusiasm to learn more about them. Um, so I just hope that like just thinking of yourself as a nature cheerleader might help. <laughs> um, Thank you. Yeah, I like that. And hey, if I can kind of jump jump on that, because that, that reminds me of something that I was thinking of. I, I um. 
there's there's a there's a linguist who does some some cool 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 stuff with like the language of the internet it's very fun that i read a lot of her writings and one thing that she'll she'll talk about is the thing that really bugs linguists is when somebody finds out they're a linguist they say oh you're a linguist how many languages do you speak and she's like i'm not a rock collector i'm a geologist I'm, i'm not a language collector i'm a linguist like she does speak more than one language she's not fluent in most of them she's got bits and pieces of some languages but that's not what she does she doesn't collect languages that she just learns how to speak like you're studying and learning about these things and being a linguist means that you have a sort of a sort of a a a, a different kinds of questions that you can think of to ask about them and it doesn't mean that you know the answer and the same thing with a botanist It's, it's not that you know every plant it's not that you've seen every plant. It's not that you, that you even know all the plants in a certain family, you know. It's that you, you know, you, you have you are interested in these plants, and and to the extent that you might be an expert, and you know, I, I think you certainly have some expertise. Um, you know, it's it's not about knowing this is this plant, that's that plant. It's knowing the right kinds of questions to ask about. Like it, it's like you can ask better questions because you have more knowledge. And you still may not know the answers to those questions, but you can think of the ones to ask. Like, like you know, somebody who doesn't know plants might not think to look at how many stamens it has and might not realize that, that might be significant. I've been learning about ferns and trying to learn to identify ferns in my area. And I, before I started doing that, I had no idea that I should look at the undersides of the fronds because that's where the spores are. And those are all different shapes and they're interesting. And you know what? I've been looking at ferns for years and I didn't know there was something interesting underneath them. Right? And I'm not an expert, but because I've learned more about it, it means I now have more interesting questions to ask. <laughs> that's, uh, you know, I, which is, I think that, that that's what makes Vea a botanist is, I think, yeah, is, is that you, you have like a whole extra level of questions to ask about things. And what's better is that you're sharing all those questions with the rest of us. <laughs> yeah. Okay. In fact, you thank reminded you. me of something. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. You first, Lindsay. Sorry. No, I was just saying thank you for that. Um, Susan reminded me of something about speaking of questions is that questions are one of those wonderful activities that, okay, this is, this is a hack coming from a person who is kind of socially awkward and sometimes I, I stumble over my words and I can be kind of an introvert. When my brain freezes up and I stop knowing what to say in a teaching situation or another situation, then I always go back to asking questions to get people to ask questions. That can be a fun thing to do, is that when things get all jittery, then I can go, okay, so here's a question about this. What is your thinking? Or I could say, okay, let's come up with a whole bunch of questions. So if you ever need an activity that's like a really, really good like fallback activity to have, then you can engage in a question generating session with the students if you're ever needing to, yeah. to fill time or just, just sometimes it can help to have, or, 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 or it might help you to find an activity that you're the most comfortable with to have that as your activity so that, that way you always have in your back pocket you got that one that you can always um, have people engage in a round of trying out even if it, even if it's a, um, an activity that you've done before like somebody else was saying earlier having repetition it can be really healthy so that's another recommendation that i have um for for when you're teaching is to have an activity that you can always fall back on if you need okay. thank you um, the, the reason I raised my hand earlier that I wanted to sort of just, emph- I, I guess, sort of back up the point, I guess, about about expertise. Um, and now, obviously, you have a limited extra problem here because you need to answer to the parents who are expecting you to be expert an expert, apparently. And I, I think that you've had some the advice you've been given about, about, you know, how to talk to them, I think, is good. And that's not usually an issue that I have to deal with. So it's good. But I... I really wanted to emphasize, I think not, not only is it okay to not be an expert on these various aspects of nature, but that's actually a strength. And it's sometimes being an expert in something can be a liability in teaching it. And I'll give you an example from my experience. As, I, as I've said, I teach college classes in math. So I'm not, I don't, I so far have not really taught nature journaling, but I have an opportunity to do so in the fall. But, um, so I'm very excited. But um, I teach math, and the thing is, is you know, like I, I, I am not don't want to like toot my own horn, but I, I am an expert in math. <laughs> I mean, it's it's um, yeah, you know, that does not mean that I know everything about math. Math is this giant, enormous field, and when you 
when you get a degree in math, you've gotten a degree in this little tiny little area of it. So there's a particular area where I have like contributed to new knowledge in math. There's lots of math I do not know the first thing about. Um, but, my, but I probably have a bit of a leg up on studying it. But the point is, is so I go and I might teach a calculus class. And the thing is, is that I know calculus very, very well. I have studied these, the, all the problems that I'm giving my students, I've solved them before. I know how to solve them or I solve ones like that. I know all the processes that, that we can use to solve these things. Um, the fact is, and sometimes I learn new things from my students, which is great. But the thing is, the, the, here's the problem is, I don't want my students to come out of that class knowing, okay, here's the step-by-step -step process that I'm going to use to find the derivative of this thing. Or here's the process I'm going to use to solve this equation. Because at the end of the day, then they've memorized this process. And then, and then the next time when they're in the real world, they're, they don't, they're not going to know what to do with that. Like, you know, what do you do? Um, what I want them to do, what I want them to come out of the class knowing is, how to think mathematically, how to take a problem they want to solve and be able to break it down in different kinds of ways and how to be creative about the tools that they have to try and figure out how to solve it and how to apply some logic to figure out whether they've solved that problem with the tools that they've used or whether they should try something different or is there even a, a solution? Because sometimes there isn't. So, and that's like a higher level thinking and it's, it's hard to teach that. And the problem is, is that I go into the classes that I teach and my students know that I am an expert in math. And I will, you know, I'll try to present them a problem that I want them to try and solve. And I want them to try and solve this problem and, and, and you know, practice these skills of breaking it down and figuring out what tools they can use to solve it and so on. And a lot of them are just kind of waiting for me to give them the answer or show them the steps because they know their teacher is the expert and knows the steps that will solve the problem. Yeah. And, you know, to some extent, like there's a certain amount of doing that. I'm just like, okay, we're gonna do this and we're gonna do that and that. And, you know, so, so it's actually really, really hard. For, like, that's the hardest thing, you know, I think anyone who teaches finds this hard to get the students to, to not focus on like step A, step B, step C, but on why did I do this step now? Could I have done something different? What would have happened? What would I have learned about this thing if I had done something different instead? And so, and, and I think, I think if, if, if it were a person who wasn't as experienced, just sort of muddling through along with them, trying to figure this thing out, it would take longer to get the answer, but they might have had more experience and, and they might pay more attention to the experience of trying to solve the problem and figuring it out. So to bring it back to, to your situation, nature journaling, I think that what you want your, your kids to, to come out of this with, you don't want them to come out of this being able to recognize every bird. Right. right? I mean, that would be pretty cool because frankly, you know, knowing the names of birds gives you a way to look up what other people have figured out, which means that you can connect what you observed to other people. So it's not, I don't think it's bad to be able to identify things because you know, we have thousands of years of human history of pe other people studying the same species and isn't it great to be able to look at what they figured out and compare it to what you figured out. So if we can identify things, that's great, but it's not the goal, right? And, you, and you're not wanting for them to go and be able to identify every bird or every mushroom in this. Um, what you're hoping is for them to learn, you know, to, to observe things, to take things slowly and pay attention, to use all these school skills of, you know, zooming in and looking at the details, zooming out and looking at the larger context, um, you know, thinking about how they can observe things in different ways by using words, pictures, numbers, all, all of those kinds of things and, and how ask questions and then how to investigate those questions. And those are, you can't, like, you can't just teach somebody how to do that, right? Like that's a very abstract thing. So you're putting them in the context of nature and trying and giving them exercises and things that hopefully will help them to do that. But I think, so to come down to, I think that, that your position as a non-expert is a strength in this because it means that when your students have questions and they ask you for the answers, that you, you can honestly say, I don't know, let's try and figure it out together. Right. And, 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 you know, and, and so follow that practice of investigating and also of being okay with not having figured out the answer exactly. Because maybe you investigate and you just don't know, you can't figure out what the answer is. And that's okay. Maybe tomorrow you find something else that actually explains the answer to the question, or maybe you don't, right? Um, you know, and, and, um, and the other thing is that also means the students have the opportunity sometimes 
to figure out something that you didn't know. And that's the best thing of all, right? Like, like my absolute favorite thing, the thing that makes me lose my mind in math in my math classes is when a student like, corrects me on a mistake or when a student figures out how to solve a problem that I didn't know how to solve or a student come, like, comes up with a different way of doing it. Because that's, that's like, that's the best. That means they've been figuring things out. And it makes them feel really good because they knew something the teacher didn't know. So the more that you can be in a, in a position where your students can know more than you or can figure out something that you didn't figure out or before you figured it out, the better they're gonna feel. And that's, that's gonna be great. And that's like the best possible success. So embrace the non-expertness, I think. <laughs> that makes going on for a while, but that's, that's, I feel very strong on that. Thank you. Yeah, that's incredible. Definitely boosts my confidence. So, Maybe you want to go next and then we'll put in Chris. Yeah, I had a quick question and then and then Chris. Um, so my question is, at, at this point right now um, of, of all of our talking, um, Lindsay, are, are you having any specific questions or thoughts that are on the top of your uh, on the top of your mind that you would like to talk about? Um, so much has been going through my mind. It's hard to like pinpoint one thing. I've just been trying to take it all in. But um, I had something a second ago. Um, I not right this minute. So um, I'm trying to think of what it was, but I can't remember. <laughs> um, oh, I know what it was. Recommendations for what to bring nature journaling. Um, guys, I'll, I'll be back in a minute. Like what type of notebook they should get. Um, these are basic questions, but um, I had some that would bring watercolors and they would ask me what to bring in. You know, I'm still kind of learning what I like to use. So it's hard to, what do you recommend for, for a group such as mine? So we'll answer that in one quick set. Chris, did you want to add something to the conversation first? And then we'll, um, we can do that really quickly. Yeah. Oh no, is Chris's internet going to go crazy on us today? Yeah, my idea I have, oh. right, um, that I have a, it's called quad animals, but you can do it for insects or anything, birds. And after you've talked about characteristics and shared a little bit, and you want to loosen the kids up to paper and talking to each other, they develop their ideal animal with four, four different chunks from different animals. So my, this happened from a story my dad used to tell us about an imaginary thing he called the rhinopotamus. And you were talking about the names. Oh no, Chris, your, Chris, your internet. Oh. Because, Chris, you know, are you able to put it? Chris, are you able to put it in the chat oh, okay. again? Because we can't hear you. Your internet is going yes, crazy again. Okay, if you put it in the chat, I will read it out loud for you like we did last time. Unfortunately, your internet's going a bit crazy on us and we can't hear anything you're saying. Okay. And you always have amazing things. Okay, okay I will read Chris's out in just a second. <laughs> um, she's always got awesome things to say and contribute. Yeah. Um, in terms of a uh, list, um, the things that Jack um, has, and, and I'm sure everybody's got like a different list. So maybe what we can do is everybody uh, in the chat, you can, because Lindsay, you can save the chat and we'll show you how to do that um, in a second. But if we get everybody to sort of give their list of what they put, um, ask students to bring, and then maybe that'll be easy for Lindsay to sort of filter through that. So when you're ready, go ahead and uh, think about it. And then when I say the magic word, which would be avocado, um, we can hit the send button and then it'll kind of go through and that might be the easiest way. So think about that. Um, and while we're doing that, everyone's thinking and waiting for me with that magic word. Um, I will say that what I get kids to do is um, when they come up to the field centers, they don't have journals. So I use a piece of paper and um, a clipboard and a pencil. Um, but with my own kiddos, um, we get like hardcover books that are sewn um, at the back here because they don't rip out. So anything that has a coil on the back of it tends to rip out. I know some people really do love those ones. 
but these ones here also having that hard um, cover allows yeah. them to automatically have like um, something hard to write on. Yeah. And if I was you, um, I would start off with like pencil eraser, a tiny ruler if they have it, and a couple of pencil crayons. That is where I would start and then see how they morph into it and how much you're doing it. And then you can be like, let's try watercolors this weekend. You know what I mean? But I wouldn't get them to come with like a plethora of kit uh, stuff, but let's see what everybody else says. Avocado is the magic word. Everybody press send. And we'll see what everybody has popping up here um, in the chat with recommendations. Um, so if it has with regards to supplies, I would ask, um, is it possible then to bring supplies from home? Can their parents supply them with a notebook or nature journal? If not, I would recommend either affordable notebooks if this um, will be long-term class or sometimes clipboard and paper and a pencil is good and definitely some water, snacks, lunch, things like that. Um, what else did everybody put in here? Maybe everybody's is similar to what I said. Hardcover journal, pencil, an eraser. Yes. Um, yes, I think that's probably the, everybody's looking like the same sort of thing, right? So really just make it simple. Simple, simple, simple to start. And you can always add things to that afterwards, right? You can try out watercolors, um, to just keep it simple, something uh, to write, uh, something to draw on, to add color. Um, yeah, there we go. If possible, a whiteboard and dry erase marker for yourself for a demo, which is be really, really key. Um, does that kind of help keeping it super simple? Yeah, for like times where we go to places like a zoo or, you know, where they yeah. can't really set up a lot or carry a lot. No, and you really want them to get the observations. They can always color it later, right? Um, a big thing is possible. Okay, uh, sometimes I might bring a few of my own nature journals to show examples. That's a really good one as well that I do as well, um, which is really helpful. So we're almost kind of coming to our end. So what I was thinking is that I can kind of give you a synopsis based on what I think was talked about today. And maybe that'll sort of help, like sort of bring our minds into where we are. But first I want to, um, I'll read Chris's. So she calls it a quad animal exercise. Um, which she grew up from a story that her dad made up um, of the rhino <laughs> looks like something possum in a kangaroo maybe, which she challenged us <laughs> to draw. My classes were always challenged to design an animal from characteristics of four animals, draw it and explain its advantages, habitats, etc. Fun and can be adapted to insects, plants, etc. So that's a great minds on, right? To really do something like that with a little blind contour really super fun and you get to be silly and then again it's not really about you know a pretty picture because you've just designed something that doesn't even exist in real life which is pretty cool okay mm -hmm. so i think if we were to mm -hmm. uh, take a synopsis of what we've discussed today i would say some of the key parts that come out are supply lists so for you that would be setting up with a whiteboard and a whiteboard marker that would be making sure that you are comfortable to so make sure that you have all the things that you need, water, snacks, all that kind of good stuff. Um, making sure that you are having um, a chat with the parents about what the expectations are and what you're bringing to the table. Um, having a conversation with the kiddos about goals and what they're looking for. Having a routine. And so I think we discussed that maybe the first time you get together, it's a bit of a looser routine. Uh, until you sort of find out where everybody kind of fits in and what your goals are and then really setting up that routine based on goals. We discussed doing it earlier in the morning. We discussed it maybe about two hours at the most and that includes sort of some breaks for eating. Um, I think some of the main concepts for lesson plans that we were looking at were really the I notice, I wonder and reminds me of depending on however it is that you want to sort of structure those things. And that can be done in a whole bunch of different ways, but you don't necessarily have to have big, huge themes every time. Depending on your kiddos, what you might want to do in those first couple of sections is everybody do a leaf or everybody do a flower together. And then you're sort of on the, page, the same page as opposed to letting everybody sort of run wild. Walking those trails or those spaces so that you kind of have a half an idea of where 
the spaces are going to be good to sit and, you know, or things like that. Are you going to collect stuff and then go to the special place to sit and do the nature journaling? So that's just a little bit of pre-planning for yourself. Um, and I think going based on some of the things that um, Chris just said and the two Kates and Aisha and everybody else is have fun. So especially with kiddos, have a couple of those really fun games that you can split up your day with, right? Um, the, the shark and the virus game that Kate said, there's another really great one that um, is out of the Project Wild manual, which is called Thicket, which your wool or your an owl, and then you have mice, and it's sort of like a, a hide and seek kind of game, but it's super close. They can only walk like 10 steps away, and then they have to freeze. So there's all these like fun little games that you can search up online, where it should just be like fun, short games, and that you can use that to break up your time as well. Um, and I I think those were sort of the major topics, right? I think that we sort of covered if we were to do order to do a synopsis. Does that help? Yes, it's awesome. Okay. Thanks. Hopefully we underwhelmed you and we made you like more focused and we didn't <laughs> re in, you know, ignite the overwhelming as we all bombard you with all of these ideas of things. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and I'll go back and look at the chat too, so. Yeah, and do you know how to save the chat? No. Okay, so when you go to the chat, it has the little smiley face for reactions and there's a three little dots there, the ellipsis. If you click on that, um, it should ask you right at the top to save the chat. Oh yeah, okay. And so if you click that, it'll go right to your desktop and um, Avea is going to try to get this video up online um, as soon as possible so that you can re-watch it, pause, take yeah, notes, right. yeah. all that kind of good stuff. And remember last week's, we'll try to get that one up as well. That was a kickoff to summer. So really looking at the things that we need to be mindful of, like dehydration, you know, our, our heat stuff, um, you know, all those kind of different ailments and water, snacks, all that kind of stuff. And then we did do one in winter as well, which is on Jack's uh, website in a blog post as well, um, which you can refer to for what do I do in the winter time and how can we sort of make that work? Um, oh yeah, and so Avea said, if anyone is unable to save the chat, you can write her an email and her email is in the chat right now um, and she'll be able to send it to you as well. So something catastrophic goes on and you missed the chat, then don't worry, um, Avea will have that saved and she'll be able to send that to you as well. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, thank you She's guys. She's smiling, so it's a good thing, right? I hope that that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, this has been awesome, really great, yeah. Amazing, amazing. All right, I'm gonna bring Avea back in here as well. Um, oh, and Avea just put in the cold water. So if you've already saved the chat, you'll have to resave it. Um, because now she's got the link in there for the cold um, weather, which is on YouTube as well. So that's awesome. Um, I personally want to thank everybody for coming out today and helping us with um, this really great topic. Uh, you can tell Lindsay that we get very excited about this topic. So lots of stuff. We hope that you come back and join us next week. Um, Ava and I have kind of figured out what next week is, but we'll hash that out in the next couple of days and get that theme up on there. Um, but thanks everybody so much for coming and then I'll pass it over to Avea just really quickly if you want to add anything. So I linked uh, the um, the nature education playlist on Jack's YouTube there too. So then you can find all of his Nature Journal Educator Forum sessions and also several of his uh, Nature Connection as well. So so those those links will be in the chat as well. And if you have any questions or concerns, you can email me or Billy Joe. so. Um, okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Nature Connections, those are really good videos to watch. I would highly recommend it. 15 minute videos right yeah. on his website. Lindsay, those would be amazing for you to look at. Okay. Really, really amazing. Yeah. Okay, everyone. Until next week, we will see you all soon. Thanks, everyone. It was wonderful. Thanks, Lindsay. Time. Bye, Leah. Thank you. Thank you, Village. Take care, everybody.